Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you all for joining the webinar on chemical and compositional analysis of uh, semiconductor devices. So here at Catan in uh, Pleasanton, California, we are blessed with being right in the heart of Sil Silicon Valley where there's many uh, opportunities for collaboration with different laboratories. This particular webinar is done in close collaboration with our friend uh, Dr. Hong Zhang at Precision TEM, who runs a, a laboratory for uh, analyzing these types of devices all the way from, uh, from the ground up to atomic resolution. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Paolo Longo, who's our Applications and Training Manager here at Catan. Uh, he's also an uh, electron microscopist extraordinaire um, who has uh, who's recorded all the data that we've taken here for this presentation. He will be giving the presentation. I want you to go ahead and take it away, Paolo. All right. Thanks, Ray, for uh, for the introduction, and also um, hi, hello to everyone, and thanks for joining our uh, our webinar. The subject here is uh, is very important, it's technologically very uh, very important. So we're going to show two different sets of uh, results from um, 3D NAND uh, memory devices, which is basically the very latest uh, in uh, in the market, um, and also of the other kind, and also FinFET devices, basically stripped from. Uh, um, from a transistor in this particular case uh, from one of uh, the latest uh, smartphones in uh, the market. Again, I would like to thank uh, my co-author, uh, Hong Zhang, basically provided all, uh, all the sample. He made beautiful samples uh, using, uh, uh, using FIB and also uh, he allowed us uh, to use his uh, instrumentational uh, precision TM uh, to take all uh, the EOS uh, NEDS uh, uh, data. This is basically the outline of uh, my presentation. As I said, you know, we'll uh, uh, mostly talking about uh, two different uh, uh, sets of uh, materials. In this particular case, you see like a 3D uh, uh, NAND devices. In this particular case, it's a 32 layer, so it's one of the very latest, probably until a couple of months ago. Then I will switch to a um, different topic. Well, we'll talk about 14 nanometers uh, FinFET devices. In this particular case, I will talk about, uh, uh, the, uh, we'll do mostly chemical analysis across uh, the contact area. Okay. So this is the instrumentation that we used uh, a precision TM in, uh, in Santa Clara. So we have uh, uh, an FEI uh, Technai Osiris operated at 200 kV. Uh, this uh, system has an XVEG, high brightness gun. Uh, it's also equipped uh, with uh, uh, Chemistem uh, EDS. Basically, well, we have four EDS detectors around, uh, around the sample. Uh, this is basically for high collection efficiency. And also, we have uh, a Gatana Infinium loaded with pretty much uh, everything from uh, fast spectroscopy to the EOS, and it's also run in a standalone system where we have. Uh, uh, all the Gatana, all the Gatana software in a separate uh, uh, computer. So, what's particular in the Osiris microscope uh, system of uh, precision and TM? So, the most important thing, something that uh, we don't have in many in many Osiris, is the possibilities of acquiring uh, EOS uh, NEDS uh, data in digital micrograph. Uh, through means of hardware synchronization, and also the operating system is 64-bit, uh, so we can take a pretty big uh, data set. So let me uh, tell you uh, very fast uh, what hardware synchronization means. Hardware synchronization is where we synchronize uh, the EOS camera readout, uh, DigiScan, and also EDS uh, through uh, uh, synchronization, but through hardware. Uh, in this particular case, every time we read out an EOS spectrum, the pulse uh, is uh, sent through DigiScan and will basically tell uh, uh, DigiScan to advance uh, the beam onto the other pixel. Uh, EDS uh, uh, detector is basically connected directly to, uh, to DigiScan. In this case, basically, the, the advantage is that we can have uh, a much higher spectral rate and we can reduce uh, overhead for improved efficiency and we can also increase uh, 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 the quality of uh, the, image, the, uh, the images that we collect uh, during uh, our acquisition. All right, so let's start with the analysis of uh, the first uh, the first sample, which is a 32 layers 3D non memory. Uh, I'm not really like uh, an engineer. I'm like uh, like a microscope. I've been looking at a lot of uh, sample uh, of this kind. This is very important from a technological point of view. But the question that I ask myself is, uh, what is a 3D NAND, like a three-dimensional NAND device? And 
I came across uh, these figures, uh, these, uh, this figure on the web, where basically like a 3 d NAND device is like a skyscraper. So what you try, you try to increase uh, the, uh, to pack as many cells as possible. Like you go in this case uh, vertically, just like uh, a skyscraper where you increase the density of people uh, inside in the same amount of uh, space. So you can clearly imagine uh, that uh, shrinking in this particular case is very, is very important as we try to fit uh, as many cells as possible inside uh, the whole structure, okay? So we looked at this sample in, under two different uh, orientation inside the, uh, uh, the stem microscope. So this is like a looking uh, kind of uh, on top of, uh, it's a cross-section looking on top of uh, each, uh, uh, each cell. So the, uh, the area, this is a stem image, so the uh, Evist study is the ADAF stem image where uh, the, uh, the bright stuff is basically the, uh, the Evist uh, uh, material, in this particular case, uh, the tungsten. So here the, uh, the analysis uh, was carried out across uh, uh, the area in, uh, inside the green box. Uh, each uh, EOS and EDS spectra were acquired simultaneously using a 3, mill, uh, 3 millisecond exposure time. You also note uh, a relatively low, uh, small collection angle, so we can definitely improve uh, the quality of our EOS data using a much bigger uh, collection angle, okay? This is uh, the, uh, the energy range for uh, the EOS spectra. Uh, this is the uh, energy range for uh, EDS spectra in this particular case. These are all uh, the maps that we acquired uh, uh, simultaneously, aluminum, uh, EDS, aluminum EOS. Overall, uh, you can see that we get much uh, better quality from uh, EOS, in particular for uh, light elements. This is something that uh, I guess everyone uh, uh, would expect. The only two maps that are kind of comparable are uh, the tungsten for EDS and EOS. They are about almost the same quality. Okay. So if we put all these maps together, uh, we, uh, we create like a color map. This is uh, what we have. Um, so we can see clearly all the layers uh, here. This is actually quite important. This is what engineers uh, want to know. You know, they want to see the, uh, the morphology. They want to see the distribution of uh, each elements across uh, uh, this, uh, this cell. So if it, if uh, zoom in on one of these uh, structure, you can clearly see you can clearly see uh, the distribution of uh, each layer. In the case of EOS, you can actually distinguish uh, easily the titanium uh, and uh, the aluminum layer. You also see a little bit of reddish, that means that there might be some uh, aluminum oxide. But this is something that uh, EOS uh, can address uh, uh, easily. In fact, um, if we extract the spectra, EDS and EOS spectra were acquired simultaneously. If we uh, um, extract um, EDS and EOS spectra, in this particular case, EDS from this region and EOS from exactly the same region, you clearly see the aluminum, uh, the aluminum line, the K line, and you also see like the silicon K in the tungsten M uh, lines. Um, we don't have in uh, EDS enough energy resolution to separate those lines, so you see a little bit the asymmetry of uh, this line, this particular case. In the case of EOS, actually, we can easily detect uh, the, uh, the aluminum. So we have aluminum here. The good thing of EOS is that uh, looking at the, uh, the shape of uh, uh, the edge, we can tell what kind of aluminum is, whether it's a bulk aluminum or it's bonded to oxygen or other elements. In this particular case, if we extract uh, uh, the spectrum uh, from uh, our sample, uh, that particular area, and we compare with uh, the EOS spectra that we extract from, uh, from the Atlas, like a, our sort of dictionary of EOS spectra in the digital micrograph software, we can easily tell that we are talking about uh, mostly some uh, aluminum oxide. So again, we can tell, uh, we can tell uh, the elements that we have inside, but we can also tell uh, how these elements are bonded to each other, how these elements are uh, chemically interacting with each other. Another advantage of uh, this is actually we came across, and I think it's pretty important, is uh, the lo localization of, uh, of the signal. If you extract uh, EDS and EOS spectra from, uh, uh, you know, the tungsten, the tungsten area, you clearly see the tungsten M line in EDS spectra, but you also see some aluminum. This is probably due to some uh, uh, fluorescence effect. If you look at uh, the EOS spectra, you can clearly see the uh, tungsten M edges, M45 edges, uh, 1809 EV but you don't see any aluminum uh, K at all. This is because the yield signal is highly localized. Okay, this is something uh, very important uh, to remember, especially for this type of analysis, so where for us it's important to know where all the elements are present. 
but we want to go beyond that. So we found that where all the elements are uh, distributed uh, with respect to each other, but now we want to know these uh, elements are uh, uh, interacting with each other. So, for instance, uh, we have uh, uh, silicon in different phases. So here uh, we took the area right across uh, this uh, this cell. So. And this data set uh, was taken now uh, with uh, increased energy resolution because now we want to look at the shape of each edge and tell what it is and tell how each element is interacting with each other. The spectrometer was set uh, with a dispersion of 0.25 EV, and what with that particular system uh, with the XFEG uh, we could get about 1.7 EV energy resolution, which you'll find is actually good enough to resolve all uh, the different phases in, uh, in the silicon. Okay? As I said, you know, data set that was the EOS data were taken in uh, dual EOS mode, so uh, focusing on the region going from the silicon uh, L edge all the way to the oxygen uh, using six millisecond exposure time, and also we have the low loss spectra taken in uh, uh, um, about 25 microseconds. Okay, so but the, the question is uh, why you want to acquire this data set in dual EOS in dual EOS mode? Again, now we are doing. Uh, uh, we're doing uh, chemical analysis, and a good part of chemical analysis is looking at chemical shift. In this particular case, uh, you know, we could see like a big energy drift, uh, you know, across uh, the entire area. We have about uh, 2 EV energy, energy drift, and when you look at, um, when you want to measure, you want to map a chemical shift, uh, it's very important to actually um, remove uh, all the effect of energy drift, uh, basically system instabilities. And this is why we use uh, DUEOS, so we acquire all the data, uh, having uh, all the core loss data, along with the low loss data, along with the zero loss peak, and the zero loss peak can be used as a reference to remove uh, the effect of uh, uh, energy drift. Okay. So if we extract the spectra from this area, we have the silicon L edge, we have uh, nitrogen, titanium, oxygen, um, but, you know, the other question that you might ask, you know, what about the other elements? We still have aluminum K, uh, 1560, tanks on M45, 1809, but obviously these, uh, these uh, edges are now out of the field of view in this particular setup where we want to go for good energy resolution, okay? Solution for that could be using uh, EDS, where in simultaneously with EOS, where we acquire aluminum uh, and tungsten using uh, EDS, and then we can combine those maps uh, with uh, titanium, uh, with the other uh, EOS maps for uh, titanium, silicon, oxygen, uh, and nitrogen. This is something very important, so we are like pushing, uh, you know, the possibilities of both EOS and, uh, and EDS. This is very, when uh, both techniques uh, are very important, become very important. So we talked about, uh, you know, the uh, chemical shift and also the shape of each edge. This is a particular case. This is actually spectra extracted from, uh, you know, the same data set. So we have a spectra from bulk silicon, about 99 EV. Silicon nitride is about 103. Silicon oxide is about, uh, uh, it's about uh, 105 uh, uh, 5 EV. So you can see that the shape is different. Also the chemical shift that we have some chemical shift. This is actually very important for us. It will uh, enable us to distinguish all the chemical phases across uh, the entire area, the entire uh, cell in this particular case. So in this case, we are reflecting the chemistry at the local bonding coordination and we remove all the effect of energy drift because we acquired the data in Goyos mode that we have the zero loss peak uh, as a reference. Okay. So you can use uh, each spectrum here uh, to uh, create some uh, chemical maps. So here we are not really talking about, this is no compositional map, this is basically a chemical map. So here we are mapping uh, the silicon oxide, the, the silicon in all its three different phases in the sample. We have silicon oxide, we have bulk silicon right here, we have again silicon oxide, silicon nitride, silicon oxide. Silicon nitride is actually very important because it acts as an insulator. So protect the sample from the charge, you know, the information inside the sample from uh, uh, the extra, the, 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 the outside charge. We can take this map, we can actually combine this map with EDS. We can add titanium and also titanium through EOS, aluminum and tungsten through EDS. So now we actually have, uh, we don't have uh, only compositional map, but we have also a chemical map. The interesting thing is uh, that if you look at uh, uh, the region between uh, the bulk silicon and the silicon oxide, you find a little bit of reddish, red area. 
meaning uh, that uh, we might have uh, some uh, silicon nitride in there. So that's actually an information, very important information. You probably want to look at this area in more uh, details and see uh, what's in there, chemically speaking. But this is actually we're pushing uh, the yields uh, possibilities. And now we know each, uh, uh, we know all uh, the, uh, the silicon uh, chemical phases, uh, how they're distributed with respect to each other across uh, the entire cell. We can also look at the same sample under a different uh, orientation. Uh, this is actually important for a failure analysis. Uh, um, this is what I was, uh, I was told. Again, the entire area was mapped in a few minutes. Uh, EDS and yield spectra were acquired with about three millisecond exposure time. So this is actually to just show you some maps for uh, nitrogen uh, yields, uh, nitrogen EDS, uh, oxygen uh, EDS, oxygen yields. Again, we're using one of the best EDS system in the market. Uh, this is just pretty some color. You can clearly see the difference of each layer is pretty well uh, separated and defined in the case of uh, EOS. You can also zoom in and again you see the difference between uh, EOS and EDS in this particular case. We didn't really apply any filter, what you see here, it's what in general PowerPoint applies when I try to make up uh, uh, presentations here. So now we are ready to switch uh, to the second example. So basically looking at, uh, again, uh, um, acquiring uh, EOS and EDS analysis across uh, the contact uh, area stack, in this case in a 14 nanometer film fat devices. I think this sample was probably prepared uh, uh, from, uh, um, from a smartphone um, currently present in, uh, in the market. So this is something that uh, you actually have in, uh, in, uh, in the market right now. Um, well, in case uh, you wonder what a FinFET technology is, uh, so here we have uh, a schematic of a 14 nanometers FinFET uh, uh, technology. So we actually, in this particular case, we decided to look at, uh, to spend attention, uh, to focus on uh, the contact area, which is in general is made of uh, silicon germanite, titanium, titanium nitride, uh, and the tungsten. This actually is pretty, this area is pretty crucial because uh, it's really hard uh, to, to grow in, uh, in a good way. And uh, if you make some mistakes, you know, during the growth, this might affect uh, the electrical uh, uh, performance of this uh, particular device. In general, people are interested in uh, the epitaxial growth of the germanium, uh, the thickness uh, and the chemistry across, across the, entire, uh, uh, the entire stack. So, so here we decided to take a different approach from uh, um, the previous example, the previous, uh, the previous sample, the 3D NANDA device. In this case, we decided to carry out the analysis uh, using uh, two different experimental conditions. Basically, the only thing that we change uh, in these two data sets is the beam current. Because uh, I always wonder, you know, what happens, you know, to the sample. You know, it's uh, because I've been visiting a lot of uh, places and people have been running the analysis with a huge amount of current. And again, you know, it would be nice to see how this, this current, this huge amount of current uh, affects uh, this, uh, this material. Okay, so we start from, uh, this is kind of low current, uh, but it's probably low current from uh, compared to the standard conditions uh, people use uh, to analyze uh, these particular, uh, this particular samples. So this is the area that we looked at. So this is the contact area. So we're going to pay a lot of attention uh, in this particular region here. So the entire area was, uh, the entire maps were acquired in seven minutes. So this is uh, the data set acquired at 150 picoamp. The other data set uh, was acquired at 850 picoamp, but using exactly the same exposure time and the same experimental condition. The only thing we change uh, is uh, the beam current. In this case, CDS was acquired from uh, 0 kV to 20 kV, so we have a much uh, bigger uh, uh, energy range in uh, EDS spectrum. These are all the maps. Again, uh, we see the, uh, uh, the higher quality for uh, uh, all uh, the yields map. You can see, you can compare germanium K with germanium, uh, uh, germanium EDS with germanium L from uh, yields. So you have much more signal. You can start to see if you zoom in, you can see some, uh, some details here which are uh, missed uh, in the uh, EDS map. The same thing pretty much happens for all uh, the elements. Uh, there's a big difference if you look at uh, uh, the light elements, oxygen and nitrogen, but it is something that uh, 
we would expect. Again, we are running this analysis with 150 picoamp. And most of the people uh, will use EDS uh, with much higher current for this, uh, for this particular system. So this is if we put colors. Again, we see, uh, we, we still get like much higher contrast in the case of EOS. Uh, this is something that we could tell uh, looking at the previous each single map uh, earlier. We can't really distinguish all the little layers here, you know, containing nitrogen. These are almost invisible in uh, EDS map, which does a pretty good job for copper, tantalum, which are comparable uh, with, uh, with EOS, but even the titanium nitrile layer is not perfectly visible uh, in, uh, in EDS. So basically we're missing all the details in, uh, in this map. You can zoom in across, uh, this is uh, the area of uh, interest for us. And you can see all the layers in EOS, you know, still well preserved, despite we're using uh, relatively low uh, beam current. Um, these again, uh, all, these, uh, all these details are basically missed uh, in, uh, in the case of EDS. Again, we didn't really apply any, any filter on this map. But even if you apply like a smoothing filter, things uh, significantly improve uh, for, uh, for EDS as well as uh, EOS, but still it also looks way, way better. And we can really distinguish very well all uh, these uh, um, little details in, uh, in, uh, in the sample. But every time you, you apply like a filter, you lose a special resolution because uh, uh, what you do, you average pixel, uh, pixel together. So ideally you don't really wanna, uh, want to filter, okay, you just want to leave the data as raw. So what happens uh, if we do the same analysis using the same uh, experimental conditions, so basically same angle, same exposure time, same area, but in this case we use 850 picoamp of beam current, so basically we increase enormously the current. This is uh, roughly the current that people normally use uh, to analyze uh, this type of sample uh, with EDS, okay? So now EDS uh, is uh, largely improved uh, compared to you know, the previous case. We can distinguish all the layers. EO still looks uh, significantly uh, better, but you know, we see like a big improvement in, uh, in uh, EDS map. Uh, okay, but you know, the question is, what about, we, we're actually pushing like, uh, from like a huge amount of current onto this, uh, this sample. So the question that I ask myself is, uh, is the electron beam changing the chemistry and morphology at the nanoscale? This is what we wanna uh, we wanna know. And we can take uh, this uh, through different approaches. The first one is actually looking at uh, uh, the image. So basically, try to compare the two images. Um, this is basically like uh, like a sub area of uh, the survey image that we used for the EOCDS acquisition. So we just uh, focus on this particular area. And uh, you can see the same thing at 150 picoamp and then uh, 850 picoamp. There's not really a big difference, although, you know, the dark spot that you see here seems to be a little bit uh, increased uh, in the case 850 picoamp. So morphologically speaking, uh, we're probably, uh, you know, like making, uh, causing some changes across the sample, across the interface. But this is not really uh, dramatic. We would probably need to go higher in magnification to see uh, the difference. So what happens if we extract uh, uh, the profile, intensity profile from each uh, elemental map? This is uh, just using yields. So we have the case of 150 picoam going from uh, um, bottom to top in this particular case, and uh, 850 picoam. Uh, overall, uh, you know, the, la, the, the all uh, shape is the same, but, you know, the interesting thing is, first of all, that we find quite a lot of oxygen uh, inside, okay? Uh, this is supposed to be pure titanium nitride, but we find some, uh, we can see some, uh, some oxygen. But the interesting thing that uh, we noticed right away, that if you look at this, this is all, this all, all these lines are normalized to the same maximum. But the thing is that it looks like the interface here seems to be wider in, uh, in the case of higher current. So we're actually changing something, even just looking at uh, intensity profile extracted from each compositional map. The other thing that uh, you can clearly notice is uh, the amount of oxygen seems to drop. Um, we can give you some number, uh, uh, some number later to see how much is uh, it's dropping. But if you look at the top here and the bottom, you can see actually from here to here, you can see the uh, and the ratio is much smaller in the case of the analysis carried out the direct current. So it looks like uh, we are moving atoms uh, under the electron beam. 
So the best way to do that is actually using uh, uh, EOS uh, to, and you know, like the good energy resolution of EOS uh, to see all uh, the features in the nitrogen K edge and see what we're actually changing. So in this particular case, uh, we extracted the EOS spectra from exactly the same region uh, inside, right at the center of the, the titanium nitrile layer. So this is the case of 150 picoamp, and this is the case of 850 picoamp. This is the nitrogen K edge. Even though we don't have gray energy resolution, but you can clearly see the, difference, the differences between these uh, two spectra. This is the pi star peak. Uh, the pi star peak seems to be much more pronounced. Uh, has a different shape, 850 picoamp compared to 150 picoamp. Again, we want to look at this in more, in more details because we're supposed to have titanium nitride here. This is what engineers put in the uh, deposit, um, though they're supposed to deposit. So if we compare uh, these two spectra from the sample at different beam current uh, with the standard, so the standard was uh, uh, this uh, figure was taken from this uh, uh, from this reference from this paper, but you can clearly see the uh, the spec that the nitrogen K edge at 150 picoamp uh, actually looks like it's very similar to what we would have uh, in the case of uh, titanium nitride standard. Um, the interesting thing that you would notice uh, is there's a big similarity, but the other interesting thing is uh, that we have a split uh, of this pre-peak, the peak of 396 uh, EV, the pi star peak. We have a, a, uh, the, the split that we observe uh, in the case of uh, the standard is actually can be observed in the case of uh, uh, the spectrum taking uh, 850 picoamp. We would need a little bit higher energy resolution to resolve uh, this region better, but again, we find about 1.82 EV uh, split in this pre peak which is actually uh, in agreement with what we find in uh, in the standard. For those of you who are interested, uh, basically the uh, the split of this uh, first pre peak is due to oxidation of uh, um, the 1s electrons of the nitrogen into unoccupied. Uh, T2G and EG orbitals that uh, we actually form when uh, the uh, uh, the 2p electrons of nitrogen and 3d electrons of uh, titanium uh, uh, hybridize. So it's due to the hybridization of 2p uh, electrons of nitrogen and 3d electrons of titanium. So there's a physical uh, reason, like a scientific reason, why we have this uh, pre-peak in this particular case. So what is going on in this sample? Because we are getting a different uh, different results, a different current. So first of all, uh, uh, this is how I think you know uh, things are happening in this case. So the electro beam is actually for in my in my in my in my opinion, you know the the I the I dose, you know the I beam current is actually forming. Uh, a chemical phase that is uh, richer in uh, titanium nitride. This is something that we can easily observe. Uh, in uh, the case of uh, the sample, uh, uh, the data set acquired uh, 855, 850 picoamp, you can see here a very big similarity between uh, this spectrum and the standard. What is the explanation? Maybe the, the I dose, uh, the I beam current, uh, so these electrons uh, are like uh, pushing oxygen atoms uh, and also all the other atoms, uh, and perhaps uh, they're forming. Uh, a richer and um, pure crystalline phase of uh, titanium nitride. So the bottom line is uh, the, uh, the interface area is damaged by the electron beam current. The other question you would ask, you know, wh wh what should we do in this case? But well, definitely you want to try to work uh, a low beam current uh, and perhaps uh, the analysis carried out at 150 picoamp uh, is definitely more pristine and more uh, reliable. But this is something very important that you have to take into account when uh, you look at this device because you know you want to get data, but at the same time you want to make sure that the data is as reliable as possible and they are as close as possible to what it should be in reality. So we are coming to the end of this uh, of this presentation again uh, since you know. Between the, the two analyses, 150 picoamp and 150 picoamp, uh, we definitely see some changes across uh, uh, the region, morphologically speaking, uh, chemically speaking. So we definitely we believe uh, we think that the data set taken at low current is definitely closer to what it should be in reality. And again, you can compare uh, the two color maps uh, from uh, EOS and EDS, uh, uh, 150 picoamp. So you can still use uh, EOS, you can pretty much see everything across this sample. 
you don't miss any detail, uh, you, have, you have enough signal. So this is because the increased amount of signal and higher signal collection efficiency in EOS uh, allows the generation of elemental maps with uh, high contrast and signal to noise ratio, even a low beam current. This is a very important point. But if you want to generate uh, EDS map, even with the latest generation of EDS detective, if you want to generate good EDS map in a fast manner, you need the good, uh, you need the high amount of current. Uh, and we see in this particular case uh, this sample uh, actually don't stand uh, the high beam current uh, and we change uh, chemically and morphology the contact stacked area. So basically the data said that we took high tangent 50 picoamp is not real, that's not really represent uh, uh, the sample. So my message is uh, to conclude this webinar is uh, watch for the effects of high beam current. You don't want to destroy your sample under the electron beam. So in summary, uh, uh, we have seen that EOS provides chemical and electronic information in addition to composition. We made a lot of improvements uh, with the latest generation of uh, EOS spectrometer, especially for uh, increasing the sensitivity of the camera so we can go much faster. Uh, two EOS is very important because it allows us to push EOS to the next level uh, and get chemical uh, information, remove the effect of uh, energy drift so we can accurately measure uh, chemical shift, at the same time we can do absolute quantification. It's, in my opinion, it's very important to acquire uh, EOS and EDS uh, simultaneously. And the possibility that we have now in Digital Micrograph to acquire uh, fast EOS and EDS in hardware uh, synchronization modes uh, is definitely open uh, new avenues in material characterization. The other important point is that the high collection efficiency of EOS uh, allows the generation of elemental map and chemical data with a good single to noise ratio and with lower beam current. So, you know, take into account uh, uh, the effect of beam current uh, and also watch for the effect of beam current. Don't throw too much current on your sample, you will destroy it. Uh, your, uh, the data, the, data the, the results that you will get uh, will not be uh, accurate and reliable. Again, thank you for uh, for the attention. All right, and thank you, Paula, for that uh, enlightening presentation. And also, big thanks to uh, Hong Zhang of Precision TM for allowing us to use his facility and his and his samples and his his expertise in this field of uh, of FinFETs and uh, 3D NAND and semiconductor analysis in general. So um, let's yeah let's jump straight into the questions. So um, first question actually came in um, kind of early. It's, it didn't say what uh, uh, microscope voltage we were using here. Oh yeah, um, we, in the presentation. And is there an advantage to going to lower voltages, especially with these uh, uh, with the damage that you may be seeing? Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the uh, the data set, the, all the data were taken at 200 uh, at 200 kV. Um, lowering the voltage uh, would definitely would definitely help, but uh, and we would actually in the other and uh, and we would actually have um, like bigger cross sections. We would get more signal for both uh, EOS um, EOS and EDS. But at that point, uh, it becomes uh, thickness becomes more important. Okay, so you want to make sure that your sample is even thinner if you want to work uh, uh, a lower uh, um, a lower voltage. Um, but yeah, this is something that you want to take into uh, into account. But as long as you keep uh, the dose uh, lower, um, you should be able to get uh, accurate uh, accurate data. Uh, make sure that uh, you don't damage uh, you don't damage the sample. Uh, this is actually the uh, in in this this is what we try to address uh, with this webinar. Hey, you know, watch uh, for the effects of beam current because I've seen many people. Uh, uh, running, uh, you know, their microscope with a huge amount of current, 600, 700 picoampere, you basically end up destroying the sample. And this is actually kind of delicate structure. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we had a couple of questions just uh, related to um, the actual data collection. Uh, um, for instance, were you using any sort of drift correction during the acquisition? Um, and uh, what would be the effect of increasing the collection angle that you mentioned okay. earlier? 
Yeah, this is a uh, fair question. Um, we didn't use any drift correction, so you know, data set were taken with maximum of a few minutes acquisition time, so there's no really need uh, to use any drift correction. Uh, bis um, so we didn't use any drift correction. You know, the, uh, the instrumentation uh, was uh, uh, stable enough. Um, Obviously, if you think about something, if you drift correction, uh, you will increase the total exposure time, you will make the sample, uh, you will increase the number, the dose uh, on, uh, onto your sample, because you still need to, to take an image uh, to do like cross-correlation. So ideally, you don't want to use uh, drift correction, but provided that you need to have uh, a stable system. Uh, but you know, like going fast and having like a sensitive uh, camera helps, because you can use a short exposure time. Um, the other question was uh, about collection angle, right? Yeah, that's correct. So, um, yeah, the collection angle actually, we should have increased the collection angle, but we were, uh, so the collection angle used for this uh, particular case was about 25, 20, 25 milliradians, which is kind of small. And this is uh, kind of limiting our uh, uh, EOS, uh, uh, the collection of uh, EOS, uh, uh, signal. So ideally, you would need, you would like to use uh, um, a uh, collection angle uh, which is probably twice, uh, uh, twice as big, just to get uh, more signal into the spectrometer. This is actually would help also for uh, uh, quantification purposes. If you want to do any quantification analysis, you're better off uh, try to integrate over as many electrons uh, as possible. Try to collect as many electrons as possible. So, but in this particular case, we were limited by the camera length of uh, the microscope. We couldn't use uh, a much shorter camera length. And also, we had the fixed uh, three millimeter aperture. So that was kind of limiting our collection angle. So there's probably room for, uh, for improvement uh, just by using a, a bigger collection angle. OK, thank you. So we had uh, a couple of questions about the chemical analysis. And I'll try to put them all together in, uh, uh, into a single question. But um, the, the silicon is, the, all the phases are real close together, or all the energies are real close together for the different silicon uh, phases. So how do you actually set up the analysis for those phases? And also, if, you're, if you have more than one phase, through the thickness of the sample. So if it's, instead of being a nice, instead of the slice showing, you know, I'm trying to paraphrase here, the slice showing uh, one type of material on the front surface and a different material on the back surface, does that affect your um, analysis? Let me go back to the slide uh, here. So we're talking about this, right? Um, um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a good question. Um, first of all, you know, you want to extract uh, um, you want to look at the shape of uh, the EOSO spectra. So we know for each phase uh, the chemical shift. So we know the shape. In this particular case, we don't have a great, uh, even though we don't have great energy resolution, we had about 1.7 EV energy resolution, but this is still good enough uh, to see the different shape. You can clearly see the different shape from bulk silicon. This is a 99 EV. This is a this is basically pure uh, uh, silicon, bulk silicon. And then we also have all the other phases. So what you do, you basically look at the shape. You, go, you look at um, you know, the, the onset position. Uh, you measure your chemical shift. But it's very important uh, that you, know, you acquire your data in uh, do your mode. And this is important because uh, you can actually correct the effect of energy drift. And even though the system is stable, we still found some energy drift. And this needs to be corrected if you want to uh, if you want to do like a good uh, and accurate uh, chemical analysis across uh, across your sample. Um, you have you could do uh, two ways, you know. Uh, what we did in this particular case, uh, we extracted the also spectrum, we looked at the shape, we looked at the chemical shift, uh, we measured the chemical shift, uh, and then we could tell uh, what it was based on that. So this is uh, this is how we call like fingerprinting analysis. So this is one of the advantages of EOS: is the good energy resolution and the fact that you can uh, have um, you can do fingerprinting analysis. So you look at the shape and you tell what it is. And that's that's what we did. And once you do that, uh, you have good quality reference spectra. And you do something. You do some fitting. So you basically create uh, maps uh, using uh, each reference uh, uh, reference spectrum. 
So if you think uh, that uh, you don't have a pure face uh, in your material, you can also look at, uh, you can also use a standard uh, or look at uh, uh, our atlas if you find something, uh, something similar that can, uh, that can work. But, you know, you can generate those maps provided that you have a pure, uh, uh, pure standard. But again, uh, you also look at the shape, look at the chemical shift, you can tell uh, uh, what you have. So we're pretty confident that what we're talking about is uh, bulk silicon, silicon oxide. It might not be SiO2, but it's definitely some silicon oxide. Okay, I think that covered it. Um, actually, related to uh, the silicon here, a um, uh, uh, question came in, which edges you're using to analyze? I mean, here it's clearly the silicon L edge, but you also show some aluminum data. Um, and related to that, another person asked, you showed some high energy edges like aluminum and tungsten, but you still had lots of counts. Um, yeah. How is that possible with EOS? Um, it's, uh, it's very much possible, you know, that uh, that's this particular case in this case. So these uh, spectra were acquired uh, under the, exactly the same condition simultaneously. So we got uh, tungsten uh, for uh, for EDS. We got a huge amount of uh, tungsten. But you know that that's that's clear. I mean, tungsten is like a metal. It generates uh, so much signal, so much scattering uh, that you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of signal. The only job as a microscopy microscopist is making sure that you use a uh, small collection uh, sorry peak collection angle, which you can get uh, through the use of the small camera length. You set up your camera in a certain way, and we have like a webinars on uh, on the web where we show people uh, how to set up uh, the camera for uh, to increase the sensitivity in uh, the EOS spectrum. Um, and just make sure that uh, the beam is going uh, in the center of your aperture. There's not really much to do. Uh, in EOS, we can collect uh, most of the signal, and you know, getting a signal from the tungsten, even though it's at high energy, but you generate uh, so much signal because the, the tungsten is pretty heavy. The other advantage of using high energy edges, like in this case, is the signal to background, so basically the ratio from this point to this point in intensity is, is quite high. So you have actually advantages with EOS to go and use high energy edges. Okay, so Great. this particular, if you wanna compare this data set with the other one, this data set that was taken with the dispersion one. So basically we, uh, reducing the energy resolution to get a bigger energy range. So now we can collect all the, uh, pretty much all the elements in, uh, in EOS. And if you use the dispersion one, you also generate the more intensity into the, uh, the EOS spectrometer. I hope this answers your question. Well, that's great. So I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, actually, we had a question, which software was actually used to analyze the EELs and the EDS data? Was this digital micrograph or we're using a third-party software? We use digital micrograph. We actually use uh, our uh, latest software uh, that uh, we are about to release, uh, GMS3, where, uh, as, uh, where we actually completely um, um, we have completely changed, uh, you know, the, the way we do composition analysis and quantification with both uh, EELs, uh, uh, EELs and EDS. So all the data uh, was uh, processed in digital micrograph using uh, the new features, uh, model-based approach, uh, and also the, uh, the new acquisition software, um, sorry, like uh, processing, uh, data processing software uh, in uh, digital micrograph for, uh, for EDS.